Who do we have in Zoom? Nobody yet, right? Except like us? Yes. Like okay. Here comes Matt. Oh, there he is. I said a little bit. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. That's funny. The misdirection. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's what it's all. You named it what? Owl Lydia. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> Tracy, Matt, Tracy, can you hear us okay? Sorry. Got Max and Tracy. Thanks for joining us. We have me, Dana, and Shannon here. Tim is is not going to be here this evening. He's not feeling well. So, so I just want to say that and Christian is is uh, pretty good at showing up. Part of the What's that? I'm hoping they can hear us. Okay. I just I want to check my out. Oh yeah, please do. I haven't done this in a while. Okay. <laughs> Tracy, can you hear us? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. But you're not stuck. Do I have one minute to get some more? Oh, you do. Fifty-eight seconds. Hmm. Hmm. Sure, when the husband's over here? Yes. Yeah, I saw a lot of the officers this weekend. I did too. She was out, I, I saw it. Um, and they were doing things, not just <laughs> I saw, uh, you know, uh, Officer Ortega and I saw um, uh, Officer Bryant, who's just very quite targeted, but he wants to come in and, and work in the events. He's our friends. Um, so, yeah, it was nice to see everybody in, in, in Kent as well. I see was at the museum the other night, and, and so was Officer Bryant at the museum also. And, she wants to say, okay, I'm just going to purchase my wallet. So I think it's one of the things you've got. It feels like they are more engaged. Right? They're not cheap. There's a task. I think they're also, I don't know, they're all sharing their stuff they need. Yeah, they could be gathering comfort in their inner world. You're looking at big ass in the room? Yeah, but then, I mean, just kind of in couple of them. I mean, like, you know, you play, you know, under our eggshells, you're kind of like, like getting into your skin. We're going to give it about another minute, and then we're going to get started. Okay, we have six city council members. Uh, we'll give it just a minute and we'll get started. If that's okay with you, give you a chance to get really fired up. Let me know when you're ready. Um, you can be good to go. Okay. In that case, it is 6.02, and we'll call this regular city council meeting of Tuesday, March the 7th, 2023, to order.
Roll call, please. I think she called me. I'm here. <laughs> Sorry. Council Member Hill. He will be absent tonight. Okay. Council Member Luna Leo. Here. Council Member Grant. Present. Council Member for Dempsey. Present. Mayor Pro Chum Green. Here. Mayor Lobby. Here. Great. Thank you. At this time, I would ask for the approval of the agenda. Is there anything anybody would like to add or delete or change in this agenda? Yes, we would like to add uh, under uh, presentations. We would add, like to add as the first presentation uh, a an update regarding the CLG grant that the Historic Preservation Commission applied for. Thank you. That would be under 8A. Right. Um, and that's the CLG update mm -hmm. from the HPC ASAP. Right. Lori Tai will make the presentation on behalf of the historic person. Great. Thank you very much. Any other changes to the agenda? Uh, then I would entertain a motion. Green moves to approve the agenda as amended. Grant seconds. Any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. All were in favor. At this time, housekeeping matters. Anything anybody would like to speak to before we get started? I just have two quick things. Please. I don't know if this belongs in a report, so I'll just housekeeping matters. But I uh, witnessed an interaction between uh, Officer Caraveo and a couple that brought a dog to the ski door. And I was just really pleased and heartened to see um, what a nice interaction it was. It was very polite, very calm. The couple was flustered and, you know, understandably somewhat upset because uh, they didn't know. Uh, but I have just thought Officer Caravaro handled it really beautifully. Um, and I know it takes two to tango. The couple also didn't respond with uh, with animosity, so that helped. But it was just, it was just a good interaction, and well, I think it spoke well to the PD. On the flip side of that, though, that couple had tried to do their due diligence, and um, I think both as a city and as a as the event holders in the future, we need to kind of double check that the if this is a no dog event, that that messaging is getting out. They did check on the Leadville Ski Drawing website. Um, and it did, in fact, say nothing about a no dog oh, event. Wow. Um, and our own signs, where they entered the main street, there were none of the no dog there used signs. There to be no dog signs. There, there, there were, but they were kind of spread oh. out. And they kind of, I think they came up through a parking lot or something. And I had to walk like a block and a half to find one. So um, I think both, we need to kind of remind the event holders if that's going to be a message we want them to carry and then i think we as a city need to do a little better job of advertising that as well um but that's it okay thank you okay. anybody else with any housekeeping matters <clears throat> okay thank you very much at this time anybody in the public would like to speak to city council on items that are not on the agenda please come and speak to us mr prestash is first Okay, it'd be nice if I could see that clock now. Three minute clock. Okay. okay. Um, my name is Steve Prestash. I live on 131 3rd Street. Um, I, I guess I, 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 I'm not well prepared for this at this point, but I would like to uh, talk about a couple of things. Um, I'm sorry that we don't do the Pledge of Allegiance anymore. I wish we would do that here. Um, whistleblowers and uh, face uh, consequences. Um, I lost my truck and my trailer to the city because of being a whistleblower. Um, anything other than that is, is uh, not true. Um, the truck was moved at a certain period of time. Um, so whistleblowers are, are recognized as uh, getting a, a strong backlash from the power authorities. Um, and government bodies actively can wander into organized crime as the city has, in my opinion, several times in the past. Um, 
Is that my three minutes, sir? No, no, not at all. Here, five. Okay, so uh, um, one of these times was when we had the uh, CUP in my neighborhood. Uh, the city uh, strongly resisted um, applying one of uh, its ordinances, which uh, said that anyone adversely affected by a CUP, the city shall hear their grievance. Shall is mandatory in Colorado. Um, the city refused to hear my grievance. I filed a court case and I would come and I'd get my three minutes and they just sit there like wooden uh, soldiers and, and not to respond. And they wouldn't give me, let me have a presentation longer than that. And in fact, uh, to muddle things up, they changed the wording from uh, shall to it's discretionary. Um, so it's discretionary now for CUP impinges on the neighborhood that the city shall have to listen to the people that are bothered by it, such a thing. So um, I think that uh, we need to change that ordinance back to where it was, makes it uh, mandatory for the city to listen to people. Now, one of the things that comes up this whole process um, of citizen input, besides the uh, backlash um, that I've faced several times from city council members, um, is I attended a meeting here that uh, Ms. Fenske, who was the treasurer uh, secretary at that time, um, told me I needed, I should attend it was a public hearing. And we had a lawyer here I can't remember her name, but I think she was of Chinese descent. She was a city attorney at that uh, advisor or something. And she made a statement to the to the city council when you uh, uh, never uh, 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 contradict your uh, administrators and pretty much don't say anything at meetings in response to what people have to say, as I recall. And um, she said this is to prevent lawsuits. Well, um, you know, usually lawsuits are presented by people that can well afford them. But the thing is, is when we don't respond to issues that people bring towards us, I think we're um, creating a situation with, not with me, but with other people where violence might uh, result. I think I'm running on my three minutes here. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is, uh, you gotta be good hearted when you run government. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Fenton. Uh, thank you very much, Luke Finken, 408 West 7th Street. Uh, I gotta admit, I put up the no dog signs for Duffy at Ski Touring. I put them up at the at, on each side of every street. Uh, so I would be to blame, and I do believe that there should be more signage for dogs. It was listed on their poster, the last one I just pulled it down there here as a memento. Um, but yeah, I totally agree. Um, on, on ski drone, it's not what I came to talk about, but on ski drone, if you've ever been at the run out, the run out is extremely scary, especially when those horses come into contact with the traffic. Um, and I know that CDOT has the, you know, Route C or whatever it is, you know, your three alternate routes for uh, the traffic pattern. Um, and I know that it has to go up, what, 4th Street, right? Right by the Scarlet. Right? But it does create quite the predicament, especially when you have some of those large animals going very fast, coming off the snow. Um, and we luckily, we didn't have anybody fall this year. We did have a couple last year. Um, and, it's, and it's rather scary. So when you look at this permit, I'm not sure if you gave them a three-year permit, um, but if you do look at this permit in the future, if you would please continue to think about where the uh, direction of the, um, uh, wh wh the where is the where is the traffic path, right? And where and where are the horses and the people and the cars the most in danger? I actually came here to say uh, thank you so much uh, for all the hard work you do and the pre and the St. Patrick's Day parade will be held March seventeenth at noon at noon. This will be a noon parade. Uh, looking forward to it. It is a temporary road delay, a temporary road delay, uh, and we are very hopeful in the past two years, we have had a uh, great response from the city police and the county sheriff of 
closing off oncoming traffic. And we have had a little bit of turning traffic from the east side uh, coming into the parade. Uh, not quite sure if that can be shored up as well. I can say that over the last couple of years that the oncoming traffic has not been an issue like it was the previous. So uh, noon, St. Patrick's Day proper. Thank you all so much for what you did. Uh, we'd like to talk to you and maybe in yeah. the future. Oh, you already did. Then you way have it. It's great. And I got a text message from uh, Representative Peterson. So I'd be glad to reach out as well. Just like, hey, this is what we're doing. Because we got to reach out to her office as well when it comes we to. We just don't know what the status is yet, September. right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Luke. Our newcomers may want to join the break and visit Mudville, and their staff is working on some other plans. So we'll keep you all posted. Thanks so much. Very cool. All right. Appreciate it. Okay, is there anybody in the public who would like to speak? Please come up. My name is um, Pat Motika and I'm at 124 East Tall Street. Um, I've lived here about 30 years or so. And um, I've been going to St. George Church about, I'd say a little over 20 years. And I understand you guys might be able to help us with some money. And uh, I just want you to know that I've seen a huge growth from when I started going to St. George about 20 years ago till now. And I even did a year of doing the meals. And it's been a lifesaver for so many people in the community. Um, we serve fresh vegetables, fruits, protein. And, um, and every year, we, it seems like we double the amount of people we help with the food bank. And so I'm a little nervous, <laughs> but um, if you could help us out, it would be amazing. Just amazing. Because we do so much good for the community. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else in the public? Uh, uh, on Zoom, is there anybody on Zoom who would like to speak uh, uh, in public comment? Okay. Thank you all very much. We appreciate when people come and talk to us. Okay, next up we have the consent agenda. These are, this is the approval of the February 21st, 2023 minutes. Any changes to these minutes that we need to note? Thank you, guys. Thanks, Pat. Thank okay. Uh, seeing none, I would entertain a motion, please. And then that moves to approve the consent agenda. Green seconds. Any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Uh, Aye. Aye. Thank you. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. All were in favor. At this time, we have a presentation uh, from uh, St. George's. Can I again? Uh, oh, you oh, okay. I don't know. So uh, we, as you all may recall, uh, St. George's came and presented at our last city council meeting. And at that time, we asked them to, you know, they explained their need and their shortfall. So the presentation happened last time. They just asked them to present us with a proposal for their request for financial assistance. And so you can see that request in your packet. Uh, and I guess it, rather than having St. George's do their uh, presentation again, should we just see if there's any questions regarding the yeah i'd like i'd like to open it for discussion and, and if anybody has any questions for st george's please you know uh mara spear we can we can ask her um any thoughts on city council's part um questions or just general state just general discussion cool um well, I, for one, think this is an amazing opportunity for us to invest back in our community in a very effective way. They've already shown how their money is a lot more, I don't know if butter is the right word, but 
Um, it gets more out of it if we invest um, the $30,000 into them for food security rather than anything else we could really do. So I think this is by far the best thing that we can do for our community um, when it comes to our food situations, especially given how much food has been increasing um, at Safeway. Any other thoughts? Well, I agree with Christian. It's also a lot of money. Um, and so in terms of the source of that, um, I, I think, you know, it's a little bit less, but it's kind of like we're sinking a bunch of money into the Justice Center, which is another, I think, critical and useful community um, item. And I agree with Christian that this is also a critical and useful community item. Um, in terms of fiscally, uh, the 30,000 right now is over what we have in this year's operating contingency. So we started with 30. However, we have that $74,000 slush fund slush that came over. <laughs> From last year, um, so I guess what I would want is some clarity from Donna that, you know, like where we could take this out of, because I think it would have to come from that and not this year's operating contingency of, of which we have twenty one thousand. So two thousand. So just to clarify, what what that what you did do is when we look at the twenty twenty three budget and we you know put everything in revenue plus expenses. We did have uh, basically that seventy-four thousand dollars that we were like, well, where shall we put this? Mm -hmm. So it was revenue over, you know, in addition to what we had budgeted for expenses. And so what you all voted to do is to put that in this year's contingency. Yes, but it, I I don't think what it does is suddenly increase our our. Like we go in thinking we have thirty thousand every year to right. hand out to community events and community issues. I, I don't think that we should suddenly expand our scope and be like, "Woohoo, windfall! We got a hundred grand. Right. What can we do?" You know, like I'd still like to be a little clear and try to hold ourselves for this year to thirty thousand and saying, "All right, if there is some special, extra, you know, unique." request that we send a hold just mentally that extra 70 grand aside so 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 what you did by your vote is you put it in a certain line item in the mm -hmm. budget okay so so it is there to yeah. use in 20 right here i get what you're saying as a policy you would prefer that thirty thousand dollars in the notes for this type of request be limited to the thirty thousand dollars and that extra 70 or by is that what you're saying no i i just you know like when we come into the contingency we say okay we're going to set like this much aside for economic development you know this is such much aside for like these kind of bigger ticket items right. and then we're left with our 30 grand so i guess maybe it's not so much a donna question but imploring my fellow council people to just mentally think about this as a different chunk coming from maybe a different part of the operating contingency, even though in our balance sheet it looks it's, it's yeah, that's, that's what I was trying to say. You, you put it better than I did. Is just mentally saying this is the amount of money we're going to allocate towards these types of requests. Okay, I'd like to hear from uh, Councilmember Luritson. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to point out that I don't know if my fellow council members are aware that the SNAP benefits. The emergency benefits expired at the end of February, and so all those SNAP benefits got um, pulled back starting March 1st. So while we think that the COVID emergency is over, um, there's still a lot of need in our community. That's all. Hey, thank you. Uh, I have some thoughts on this. Uh, you know, when Mara uh, presented to us, uh, she said their shortfall, if I remember correctly, was about $53,000. That was their anticipated mm -hmm. shortfall. And so I have to admit, I had a number lower than this in mind. <laughs> uh, and, and what I was thinking is about $20,000. But part of that is, uh, to Tracy's point, 
the county has been in discussion with the nonprofits around SNAP benefits and trying to get those SNAP benefits, uh, uh, the, the enrollment to improve. And, and to me, that's part of the answer. Uh, not just everything falling on St. George's, uh, but but then if, if the enrollment in SNAP benefits improves, if it even doubled, we still wouldn't meet the, the state average, but at least it would it would make a huge difference in this community in terms of food access. So my thought process is it needs to be some of both of these things. And I think I, I, got, I got the impression from the people I've talked to uh, that the the uh, the attitude is at the county is they're going to try harder. They're going to they're going to work on some measurements so we can see what kind of progress gets made. Um, so my thought was around twenty thousand dollars, and in the hope that SNAP benefits would close part of that part of that gap. That's that's just my thinking. I guess. Oh, go ahead. I will say that um, I was there through the whole meeting, um, and I will agree that it seems like um, a lot more of a collaborative space than it traditionally has been, and I'm really happy about that. My worry is the community has been at this for like a while now. It's been a few years, um, and I don't mean the nonprofits. I mean the community trying to access these SNAP benefits. <clears throat> they may feel a bit of um, hesitancy to come back to these programs, given how they may have felt they were uh, treated uh, previously. So I think it's important to note that I, all of us want that to be the reality and it has to be part of the solution. There's just no way we can solve this problem on our own. It, it's not realistic. We need the federal funds and recognizing that it may not happen in the, it may not double in the next couple of years. It might take a fair amount of time to kind of break down that. I know I was kind of optimistic. I get it. <laughs> yeah. So I think 30,000 <laughs> I being is a lot, but definitely well spent. I was gonna just kind of echo that, that I've also sort of peripherally been watching this conversation develop. Um, and I think while that's everybody's, while that is most of our aspiration to see the SNAP enrollment go up, there is a fair amount of bureaucracy involved that mm -hmm. it will just inevitably be slow. And since this is a one-time thing and it, I kind of view it as a patch, um, that I think I, I have to I have to say I'm going to be okay with whatever city council decides is an appropriate donation <laughs> to St. George's. Um, do you mind if I ask a clarifying question? Please do. Um, yeah, because we just honestly weren't super sure at St. George in 2021 when Britt Woodrum was still there, she had written a proposal. Um, for I think it was three years of funding from the American Rescue Plan funds and. 25 from the city and 25 from the county. Um, so, and I think 2023 would be our last year requesting those. We did already include those in our budget. Um, so, and we still have the gap. So I just wanted to confirm, yeah, that the American Rescue Plan funding can still be invoiced. I, I assume that's correct, but I'd have to go look at my paperwork. I have all that in a folder. Uh, and I can so, confirm that, but not off the top of my head. Okay, yeah. So we um, took into consideration those when the council committed to those funds. So, Mayor, you gave me that list of all the funds that I we did. committed to. Uh, we took that into account when we did our uh, uh, employee retention program. We used our funds for that. We counted on all of the organizations getting that previously committed money. So the only question is, um, Donna has kind of closed out the books for 2022, but if you haven't invoiced us, we can figure it out. But that money was allocated and budgeted to be spent. Okay. It, let me put this way, it hasn't been spent. Yeah. We haven't allocated it to anything else just because you haven't invoiced us. Okay, perfect. I mean, I think, don't quote me on this, but I do think Liz had invoiced the administrator at St. George had invoice at the end of 2022. Okay. So yeah, okay. we'll probably just do it a little earlier this year okay. to close out that commitment. So I I'm I want to continue the conversation around I, it feels like we have uh, I'll call it 
uh, and a consensus that that this is uh, you know a direction we want to go in terms of helping St. George close this gap. Uh, so now the question is, what is the amount that we're comfortable with right now? Uh, Max, give us your your opinion. A uh, question is, <clears throat> I don't have, I mean, I think we do have to, I mean, I, I think it would be wise for us to contribute to this need. Um, my question is, is in years in the future, is this going to be an annual request from St. George's? Um, and, and are we prepared to continue to support them at the amount that we're going to provide today. Uh, so um, <clears throat> it's not it's it's not about for me it's not today's ask it's about the sustainability of perhaps the ask and the need in the future. Uh, okay. so, <clears throat> I'm open to numbers that people have to suggest. Thank you. Tracy I'm okay with 30,000. I'm not worried about the future right now. Um, I'm just worried about this year. So I'm okay with 30,000. Thank you very much. Christian. Uh, 30,000 sounds fine to me. Tina. Uh, I'm fine with 30,000 and I'm also okay with saying like this seems like sort of a unique ask and committing 30,000 does not mean that we are either capable or willing to you know turn this into an annual thing because we're yeah. lucky right now we are lucky but right now. We are so i don't know about the i concur okay that was easy <laughs> uh i could certainly live with thirty thousand, and i appreciate everybody, everybody's consideration uh i would entertain a motion um to contribute a second um i would entertain a motion to contribute to saint george uh, according to their ask of $30,000. Um, but let, let's hold up for a second. We do have a public comment on this particular subject. Mr. Prestash, what, what do you have on your mind? I have quite a bit to say, it will exceed three minutes. Um, I have attended sort of St. George's longer than any in this room and longer than Patty had. Um, I remember to Father Tom saying was that if they can't uh, eat mac and cheese, then they're not hungry. Um, I remember that statement from Fondly. He was one of the, the earlier uh, of the people that was making food there. Um, when his wife would cook, she was a really nice meal. He was a mac and cheese kind of guy. Um, I think uh, we have uh, unsubstantiated um, facts and figures here. And from my experience working at St. George and complaining about a massive amount of thefts, um, I, I, I don't think these are realistic figures. Um, the terms uh, duplicated families are misleading. Um, my guess that maybe 200 people, and I'm really making a guess here, since I, I worked there for approximately eight months at the uh, food distribution on Wednesdays and Saturdays, would be about 200 people on each of those days. So there's eight of those in a week, in a month. That would come to about 1,600 people, I think. And maybe the same 24 people would come to eat at the meals. Um, that's about half of this 3,175 figure. Again, I'm not exactly sure. I don't have the numbers. Um, I went to St. George's meetings three times to uh, the uh, steering committee meetings to complain about food theft. Um, before I start that, it's my understanding that the high school has a, a provision that the cooks are not allowed to take food home. Um, this prevents a uh, theft, this prevents um, overcooking with the idea we're gonna take this home. Um, it, it, it makes things a lot more reasonable. Um, 
St. George's doesn't have that policy. And I would like to talk about that last. Um, you have, about, that, you have that, about a minute left, so this is keep it take more than three minutes. Um, then, We're talking about thirty thousand dollars. I understand. Like to get three minutes for each ten thousand. You'll you'll be like held to three minutes. All right, Mr. Mayor, it's taken up some of my time. Um, the first thing I complained about was I went in on a Wednesday. I, Wednesday I worked. We got uh, done with the uh, thing. I was the last one to leave the building, I believe. And I came in Thursday for the meal and I went in to check, do some more work. And 30 bags of flour disappeared. Um, I complained about this at a, at a meeting. And uh, Susan said that these things go in cycles. Um, Amy said, we don't pay for that. We didn't pay for that stuff. The last thing I complained about, which was at the third meeting, since I don't have time to really go into details here, was approximately 90 flats of pinto beans disappeared, 24 cans to a flat. And if they were uh, sold for a dollar can, that would be $2,160. Also about 45 flats of black beans disappeared. This is from the admin storage. So the total there is $3,240. So St. George's loses a lot of food money because the cooks take whatever they want. They, they, they take you know, cases of this stuff home. And th this is wrong. There, there should be a, and there's no ethical uh, thing on that. Um, I was punished for bringing these issues up. Um, to talk about the honesty of Susan again, um, I was there in June when she told somebody that wanted to be a volunteer and get paid that the only person here gets paid is loose. I said, wait a minute. I happened to be staying, working there. I said, the four cooks get paid. And then at that meeting that I went to um, in June, I pointed out that we also have a bookkeeper that gets paid. We have a, uh, uh, a driver that uh, takes a bus down. He gets paid. And then, you know, so, you know, for her to tell somebody that the only person who gets paid it, it, it is loose. This starts to reflect on uh, is on these figures of thirty one thousand three thousand one hundred seventy five families duplicated or served. So I think uh, St. George's needs to have an inventory program. I think it needs to uh, get to um, handling this food realistically. There should be no uh, the food access is there twenty four hours a day for the folks. Um, a, a, a food service truck. Sideswipe my my van. Steve, was, you're at about five minutes now. I'm going to ask you to wrap it up quickly. And I was there at six o'clock waiting for a tow truck to go to uh, the. Uh, anyway, the woman shows up. One of the cooks shows up. She had been there, and she's loading food into her, two boxes of stuff into her car. I mean, uh, one woman <clears throat> was taking constantly was taking extra food home. And then when meals were cooked, we'd run out of stuff. This one was taken. I have examples of this, but I don't have time. Steve, she was taking these your things. Time is up now. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I believe that we have finished our discussion. We appear to have a consensus. You can certainly. <laughs> take the public comments in, into uh, into account if you if you so choose. Uh, but at this time, I, I would entertain a motion, please. Lumina moves to um, approve giving St. George's three thirty thousand dollars from the contingency funds using the seventy four thousand funds in there as the source. Green second. We have a, a motion and a second. Mayor. It, yes, please. Could I amend that motion to say if ARP funds are available, we should use those? I don't think they are, but um, but we can we can analyze that. We had uh, we had talked about using the remaining uh, ARPA funds <clears throat> for the. <laughs> Sorry, acquisition of the affordable housing parcel for trailers. Sorry, I didn't catch all that. 
uh, 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 Ms. Simonson said that we had we had uh, discussed uh, that we would use the remaining ARPA funds, which we think is two hundred nineteen thousand dollars, but that's not an exact number right now, uh, for the acquisition of the affordable housing parcel uh, in the rail yards, which which ARPA funds can be used for that acquisition. We don't know how much that's going to be, correct? We we have not finalized that negotiation. The answer is no, we don't. the The price that that uh, they had quoted to us was two hundred forty thousand dollars, which would be for five units, which was I mean, uh, around forty five thousand dollars a lot. Um, but that's the that's the last uh, earnest conversation I believe we've had with the rail yards on the price of that parcel. I would like to add in after the public comments, just to ask, I'm not asking the, the food pantry or St. George's to, to respond today, but just ask that you consider those comments as you meet together as well, because I think, you know, there are someone's opinion, someone's thoughts, someone's, um, someone's experiences, and I think that's worth considering. So I'd ask you to consider that at your next meeting. But also possibly, uh, an observation mm -hmm. by one person in the public, but who knows how many people have, sure. have the same concerns. We sure. don't know. Thank you. Any other discussion? Yeah, I just would like to make one comment um, Please. regarding the public comment. I don't think St. George qualified people during COVID to accept food boxes. Um, and I know for a fact that one very rich individual was collecting food and literally letting it rot in his car. It, granted, he had some dementia issues, but I don't think it's up to us to judge who is accepting food or taking food home. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> Any other discussion? on our motion. Roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tem Green. Yes. Council Member Pergenti. Yes. Council Member Grant. Yes. Council Member Linnell. Yes. Council Member Loretta. Yes. Mayor Lobby. Yes. And I, I appreciate I appreciate the discussion around this. That was very very helpful. Thank you very much, uh, Mara. Good luck. Thank you all. And thank you for coming to us. Yeah, no, I really appreciate it. Um, okay. Excited to serve the community. That's good. <laughs> yeah. And Mr. Prestige, for what it's worth, uh, we do appreciate your comments. Mm -hmm. Next up, we have a discussion regarding diagonal parking God. on the Hunter's Lock of, <laughs> of West Fifth. Uh, I will tell you, I've gotten a lot of pushback on the diagonal parking there, and I, I, I and I, I know we've heard both sides of that story. So I wanted to open up to City Council before I made a rash decision <laughs> uh, about what what is our perception of that and. How how should we move forward? So before we uh, we have a staff a few pieces of information okay. from staff and uh, just so you know why this is coming to you now. Oh, can you just take that down for a second? So that because that's changes. So <clears throat> this is coming now uh, because the police department has gotten a number of concerns raised in the area. And so we've kind of hit the point where, as I say, we need to fish or cut bait. So uh, police department's getting a lot of concerns about the way people are parking in that area, especially when the snow is covering the paint. So the paint tells you where, you know, which direction you need to park. And when the paint is covered, people are still parallel parking because maybe they thought that that was the way that it was in the past. So we're bringing this to you now because we, we, if we're going to keep the diagonal parking, we need to put up signs so that when the snow covers the lines, people know to park diagonally and not parallel. So before the city committed to signs saying diagonal parking, 
we wanted to bring up the issue and say, are we going to commit to the diagonal parking or do we want to go back to parallel parking? So that is why it's come to a head is that the police department is getting a number of questions and are we going to ticket people if they can't see the lines? So we needed clarity. And so what we did is we had an internal staff meeting and we, we had streets, we had planning, we had police, and we talked about it. And so um, this is where I'm going to hand it over. Chapin was nice enough to do a little legwork today. And we have some um, very interesting information about the actual space on the roadway. So, sure. Take it over, Jay. Right. I mean, now we can, sure. now you can distract so, with the visuals. So, <laughs> the, that, that street right now essentially has three, you know, three components. It has what's on the right hand side of the screen, which is the diagonal parking. It has the the center travel lanes. You know, travel lane in each direction, and then you have the on the left hand side of the screen on the south side. You have the parallel parking. Um, so I wanted to go out there and just document what what is existing in terms of uh, dimensionally. Is there anyone to zoom in on that a little bit? Um, I would tell you those are the same measurements that I made, okay. and that that my final determination was there was a twenty foot drivable right of way. Okay. And so that's the same thing that you're showing. Okay. All right. Good. So so uh, from on the right hand side of the screen, um, from curb to the, the white line that defines the diagonal parking boundary, that's fifteen and a half feet. Uh, then um, you from that point all the way across to the other curb, you have 28 feet, but eight feet of that um, is, and then this is just you know the dimension you need for parallel parking, eight feet minimum. So that leaves you with a 20 foot travel lane, as the mayor just mentioned. Um, and then, Lord, if you mind scrolling down, uh, not to the next page, just to the bottom of this page. Um, so, per, oh, I'm sorry. So, per, per code, um, our, our code refers all, all of our street dimensional standards. Uh, it uh, just adopts the uh, Lake County standards by reference. Um, I don't know if you're able to, but I just incorporated that text in there. Um, it looks like we're not able to show, show the bottom part, but uh, I'll just summarize this. So so our, our code references Lake County code. We don't have our own street standards. Lake County code says 12 feet minimum for, uh, for a travel lane. So if you combine that, that's but, but, but Highway 24 is 11 feet. Driving lane on Highway 24 is 11 feet. And I'm just letting you know, and I'm sure there's variations all over town. Yeah, that's, that. that's what the code says. Yeah, you know, it's going to have to get your act together. Uh, so, so technically, uh, your city code says that um, that travel lane is supposed to be 24 feet, but you only have 20 feet. Oh. I, I think part, I'm sorry, a part of the issue is, is my personal opinion is 20 feet adequate. <clears throat> 10 feet at each side. The real problem is if you look at the diagonal parking, there's a back line. <clears throat> People are not supposed to park, so they extend over that back line, but we have a lot of vehicles that do. <clears throat> when that happens, that cuts into the travel lane, and now it, it causes a problem. So that's, that's that's one opinion I've come to. The, the thing we wanted to, this is why we just wanted data. We wanted facts. So I appreciate Chapin going out there taking all the measurements. Now you have the facts. It's 20 feet. The code says it's supposed to be 24. I think you know the issue is with the diagonal parking. You, it's an, the advantage is you get more parking spaces. How many it? more? 30 percent more. Okay. So the the advantage and the reason you 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 know you try this is because you increase parking in a dense area of town. You know, you you decrease people circulating for parking, carbon emissions, all the things about you know people wanting to find a place close to where they want to be. So the advantage is more parking spaces. The disadvantage is parallel parking is generally more difficult. I mean, a, a diagonal parking is more difficult for people to back out. With this, you know, smaller distance, it's less room. We have some complaints. So the reason we're bringing this to you is to weigh the positives and negatives. And so it's for us just to present to you. The advantages and disadvantages and decide is parallel or is parallel parking better here or is diagonal parking better for this location. We're not going to make any decisions tonight about citywide, you know, does diagonal parking work everywhere? It's just this one small section. Is it working or not working? And so that's why we wanted to do, you know, rather than guessing about what the numbers are, I asked Jacob to go out and he was nice enough to today to, to take and get that data for you. One of the things we talked about, Dana will remember this, is the possibility of one way mm -hmm. on that street, which would solve that problem. We still have diagonal parking, and we wouldn't have a width problem. 
Do we have any data on fender benders? Uh, that occurred on that block. So let me just double check here. Um, I that was the police department, and at the time of our department meeting, the chief was not aware. We had anecdotal information about um, near misses, so some complaints about some near misses. Um, we did have a come uh, actual, I think, a damage of someone opening a door into another car. But I don't think that was a backing out issue. It was a proximity of the group. <laughs> so if you mean someone backing out and hitting yeah. someone else, <clears throat> I don't I don't believe so. Or cars, you know, having some sort of an accident where they're on oncoming traffic. I mean, I, I would say it is narrow. I mean, there's no doubt. Uh, but I would also say uh, I know how to drive. I mean, I don't know so how I to put that, you know. Your question is, is that we have a lot of anecdotal information about near misses. Mm -hmm. So could we make it one way and get two sets of whatever kind of parking that is? Well, te technically, your code prohibits one way. Because technically, the county, the city's code references the the, the well, we have one way to solve the largest city. And it doesn't make any sense. And, and the county's code says one way streets are prohibited. And um, I think in the past, we've, we've also, most of our streets can't, they may be wide enough for one way diagonal, but two way diagonal no. is too makes the. Well, no, I would, I would not propose. I would no, propose no, 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 but I mean, yeah. two diagonal on both sides is has been problematic, at least in the measurements. Before the other thing is, is that 16 feet six inches? Is that what I'm seeing up there? 15 six. 15 six. When we did diagonal parking in other parts of the city, we did 19 six to the back line, mm -hmm. so 22 foot vehicles would fit. Yeah. So that's that a that's much narrower than any other diagonal parking we have in the city, just as, as a, a point of. Yeah. Understand it's so hard because I usually walk to the post office, but when I do drive, it's really obvious that there's more parking opportunities. Oh, yeah. You know, like I remember when it was mm -hmm. parallel and you drive around and try to find like where I park, and it's so obviously much better. But I also get like sort of how harrowing it is to can we go like to the uh, so you just click through it's um, it's, it's on the slides for you. Know? Uh, it's really right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. I don't know what So if you press the minus button on it, and then the other one uh, on the brick cameras on where the Zoom participants are. Uh, and then at the top left of that box, there's a minus button. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, you're good. And then you should be able to. Where am I going to Yeah, I don't know. Never mind. For sure. What are we looking at there? Well, so this is, I wanted to see an aerial. It, have you ever uh, seen it be, so this as far as diagonal versus parallel. I mean, I'm wondering if the issue is the first part of the block, that's where people are having issues with the diagonal and more like I understand what Council Member Green is saying, like right in front of the post office, mm -hmm. uh, it is handy to have extra parking right there. So I will say diagonal down near Harrison on Fifth is kind of problematic, especially with the larger vehicles. If you're turning onto Fifth, it's like kind of a blind. So that's my my uh, other I mean, I mean, the other one. Question is is if if have you ever seen their it transition from parallel parking to diagonal parking? Um 
I, I would say this. I sat down and talked with the postmaster, <clears throat> Rick Sandoval, and, and he he didn't have a strong opinion, but he said clearly there's more parking in front of the post office. Uh, but whether or not it's diagonal or, or parallel, he didn't he didn't feel like he had a strong <clears throat> opinion. <clears throat> What was the was there was there a discussion in your staff meeting around this? What was yeah. there a feeling about what we should do? Well, the consensus from the staff was we need to commit to one system or the other because the reason the issue was raised was the police department was getting complaints about people parking every which way. Some people parking parallel, and some people parking diagonal. So we ought to need to label it diagonal parking so that when it snows, people still know how to park. And I, I think that there was, I won't say a general consensus, but there was a concern about people just having more difficulty navigating the backing up with diagonal parking. I don't think that's a this community issue. I think that that is a common issue with the diagonal parking. It's common all over town. I mean, it I don't disagree with it. Yeah. Community where you have diagonal parking, it is more prone to people having that friction of the near misses. But the trade-off is you get more parking. Uh, just historically, when we we talked to CDOT about re restriping Harrison Avenue, we wanted diagonal parking on Harrison, and and they said no, it creates uh, more accidents, and they weren't willing to consider it. Um, so. <clears throat> I reminded them that Ure, if you come into Ure, uh, they have diagonal parking on both sides of, of the highway, so. Yeah, and that's the other issue too, is we're pointing out there's probably other places in uh, where we have not followed our code, but it doesn't mean we should continue to not follow our code going forward. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just because we have done it in the past doesn't mean we should continue to do it in the future. I think the issue is that some of the concerns we're getting is people are saying there may not be enough room. Good. And our code is saying, technically, there's not enough room. One of the conversations I've had, uh, I didn't see, oh, I couldn't see that. The light was in there. Max, please go ahead. Well, two things. Number one, the only time I've ever seen a problem with the diagonal parking on that street is when there is a large truck uh, that is parked diagonal right off of Harrison on West Fifth. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to make it so it's only diagonal parking is only available for compact cars right off of West Fifth instead of having, I mean, we're talking, I'm talking about like, Ford F-250s with the long bed. That seems to be the issue with people just parking right off of Harrison there. Um, now, that being said, I don't know if we could just make it so there's some signs that say diagonal parking, compact cars only, or whatever it is in those areas. But to Lori's point that I just heard, if we're not um, up to our code on the width of our street, we have to go back to parallel parking. I think is the answer if we're not up to code. Um, but I, I personally don't mind the diagonal parking. I think it provides more parking spaces in a pretty congested area. Um, and if if that can alleviate some of the concerns off of Harrison um, or make it so the parking starts farther away from Harrison, um, it, I mean, I literally have, seen like the back end of a large truck almost like right there as you're turning right onto west fifth so anyways that's my comment i would agree Max. and we we have done that another parallel parking uh diagonal parking around town where the first space or maybe the two first two spaces has a shorter back line for parking <laughs> as opposed to the the full full width line but but that uh, that fifteen feet six inches doesn't lend itself to longer vehicles at all. It wouldn't even allow a twenty two foot vehicle. Um, so not sure where to go with that. My my I would I would tell you my inclination is this. I've heard from enough people 
sometimes it's not a matter of right or wrong. It's not a matter of what, what you think is best. If the public, if the public is coming to you and saying, we're uncomfortable with this, then maybe we shouldn't do have done it. So, so yeah. I guess one concern that I have is say we do change it uh, to follow along with code, are we going to go back and change all those one ways? Yeah. <laughs> like modify the code and any other code violations that we may have? Like, all right. I mean, I don't know what the best idea is. I have no clue. I don't know. I had never heard that before. It's one of the stupidest things I've ever heard. A lot of cities use one ways as a as a good proper traffic management yeah. pattern. So, they just do. So, the, so here's the here's the longer answer: is that this happens all the time. Mm -hmm. It happens with our municipal code all the time. Sometimes we'll be researching something in the municipal code and realize, wow, we have all these things we need to do. <clears throat> you can do them all at once, or you can do them as they come up, right? And so the, with the one-way streets, there's a number of things. You can, yes, you can decide at some point you want to remove all those one-way streets. The second thing you could do is you could change the code. Yes. So uh, what I'm saying is that is a, a discussion for another day that we may want to have. Mm -hmm. um, I can guarantee you that's probably not the only thing that is a, a, a violation of our code in some way because our city is really, really, really old. Mm -hmm. So there's probably lots of things that, that we will discover over time need to be corrected. The question, I guess, is, you know, what, what should we do about this current one? And then, you know, if we get to the point where it is really troublesome that we have these one-way streets, we can schedule another work session like this and decide what you'd like to do about that. But when we adopt the model traffic code, a lot of times we'll, we'll, we'll say, okay, we're adopting the traffic code except for we're changing this one part. Mm -hmm. our, in our city, we're going to allow one. And I'm sure that's why other cities have one way streets, is they've just made a provision for it in their code. Or they weren't dumb enough to put no one way streets in the code in the first place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Take yes, one please. point of clarification that I neglected to mention when I was talking about the, the, uh, the dimensions of that um, diagonal space, um, uh, I'll call it the, the depth from the white line to the curb. Right now it's 15 and a half feet. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have a standard for that. The county doesn't have a standard for that. Mm -hmm. But the, in other jurisdictions that I've seen, that minimum depth is 16 and a half feet. So it's already at least a foot shorter than it should be. And as I said, in the other parts of town where we've done Niagara Park, it's 19 and a half feet. Yeah. To, to allow for 22 foot long vehicles. It allows a lot of vans to be able to park yeah. in the diagonal spaces. Uh, Tracy, any insights? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that Fifth Street tends to be a little bit busier because of the post office and the county building. And I also think that, like, I, I didn't realize that diagonal parking was shorter than other areas. And I'm sure most people don't either. And I have a suburban, and I would not have thought I couldn't park there. So I think if we're gonna do diagonal parking, it should be consistent everywhere. So if we can't fit a 19 and a half foot diagonal, then we probably shouldn't do it. Thank you. I think that that kind of hits the nail on the head, actually. Well, and I I yeah, I mean I like it. I just think it's been very useful. However, I think your point of saying, yeah, you know, like if there's this group of people who really likes it, but we have a significant number in the community who have concerns about it, like that needs to drive our action. I, I kind so. of agree. Shannon. I don't think I have any other comments that haven't been made. Okay. Thank you. Christian, any last thoughts? Oh, I would love it if we could just say and make it a one way. <laughs> yeah. um, that sounds like the easiest solution. It does, it does. Try it to something else, but it's against code. Um, yeah, I, I think without that tool, it, it isn't safe. I mean, I almost hit someone because they were begging up and didn't see me, but kind of keep an eye out for that as a local 
horse kind of dull is my experience, and that's a dangerous situation. So, right. thank you, Mr. Prestash. Briefly, um, we've been talking about well, you've been talking about me um, about uh, it seems like an accepted fact that we have lots of uh, one way streets in town. As far as I know, there's only three. Um, it's on the west side there between 7th and 6th. It's, I guess it's two blocks down. Then there's one over here that heads on to uh, uh, Poplar from uh, on to 9th. And um, a new one was added in my neighborhood, which I highly object, object to. Um, and Jim objected to it when he was the, uh, it was put in there at the request of uh, Mr. Squires, as I, I, I recall, to facilitate Brandy Boone having an assembly of vehicles parked there beyond the 48 hour limit and my new neighbor having a, a collection of vehicles parked there. Um, so we don't have lots of one-way streets unless I missed one somewhere. Lots of chestnut. And they're all, you missed chestnut. They're all like three blocks. I'm one block each, so. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, do we want to, oh, I see, Claire has her hand raised. Claire, please. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for giving me a few minutes to talk. I appreciate it. Um, I'll make it really quick. I just do want to express that I do have concerns over the diagonal parking um, on Fifth Street. I do think it is a safety hazard. I know you guys have been hearing a lot of antidotal evidence, um, and I hope that people are having issues. They are reaching out to Leadville PD to talk about them. But from a public safety perspective, that road is very narrow. Um, we do have parking on both sides of the road, and that is the pullout for the sheriff's office. There is also the alleyway going between the courthouse and the human services building. Um, and people coming out of that alleyway do have seen uh, trouble seeing around the diagonal cars there. So I do want to encourage you all that uh, you all to take this from the public sa safety perspective as well, um, and the other users using that roadway. Thank you very much. Um, do we want to reach consensus tonight? I mean, I feel like we're in a position to do that and to give staff uh, some appropriate direction. Uh, at this point, it's my opinion that as much as I like having the diagonal parking on that block, and I think it's it's helped. Uh, I do believe it's too narrow, and uh, in, in based on a lot of anecdotal evidence, I understand that, uh, but that's my opinion. Max? Don't want to my mute button. Yeah, I, I think I know which direction we're going to be leaning uh, for consensus. This is going to parallel parking. If we do that, um, can we make sure that we get some sort of press release out to the paper? a couple times before we do so. So the, you know, maybe even make the fact, you know, make them aware before we change it, that we're going to change it at a certain date. And then afterwards, actually go back out to the paper and say, we've changed it um, and have, because not, you know, we've, we've, it was parallel, it's now diagonal. We're gonna go back to parallel. Um, I don't know when we're going to be able to do that to change the striping, probably in the spring, but, uh, you know, it, it's something that I think there's a timing component to it. So we don't have people following the painted diagonal signs right now when we decide to make a parallel and vice versa. So I think there, there's a timing component if we change back to parallel that we have to contemplate uh so because right now we have painted stripes that's diagonal okay very so, good point thank you max on that point snow <laughs> um of snow uh, say we were to remove it the like upcoming year i mean not everyone goes to the post office more than once a year if it's diagonal now we probably need some type of signage that says no longer diagonal we would have to sign it as parallel parking yeah. yes i totally agree and we can't really i mean uh, we, to your point with the snow it's not like we can effectively re restripe at this it's, point it's going to be gonna probably be mid mid to late april which gives us ample time for press releases 
Okay. <clears throat> Shannon, dive in. <laughs> what what's your feeling about it? Okay, so my feeling is I'm wondering after we change it back, how quickly till we get the complaint that there's less parking? Almost immediately. Almost immediately. <laughs> Tracy, any last thoughts? It feels like we have uh, a consensus about staff direction. Are you okay with that? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and the timing of it, uh, to Max's point, uh, will be such that uh, we should we don't we need to not be in a big hurry. So let's say we do it by the end of April, first of May. Uh, but in the meantime, we have it in the newspaper two or three times. Yeah, I, I'd like to talk to the streets department manager just about the timing of his crew and when weather wise it'd be best to get out there. So we had that striping done by a professional company, but our our streets department crew is capable of removing the striping that's there. We we probably have to rent uh, a sandblaster. And we do have a striping machine um, that we can put in the parallel parking. I wanted to raise that issue since we're talking about it. We had talked last, last late summer about marking the streets parking because yes. we have quite a contingency in our community to put out trash cans to hold spots or they park just so you can't squeeze in or squeeze out. And so I'm wondering about the possibility of that, or can we? It's actually on our list with the street department. To talk, we talked about that in our meeting about what, what do we want to accomplish that this summer? Uh, in that case, that could be the company that's come up and done our, our diagonal striping, but ask them to do parallel striping mm -hmm. on, on uh, West 7th and West 8th mm -hmm. in particular. And okay. I had a discussion with the uh, police department just in general about people putting up uh whatever devices in front of their property to reserve parking and we uh, i talked about that a little bit when you do the ski during report but but we have will be letting and have let some of those property owners first first of all we won't be enforcing any private made signs <coughs> um and second of all this is back a while back i sent the police department the code which says basically you can't create fake traffic signs and or you know that it is against our code to create these signs and put them up. So we, in the past, have notified the property owners that we're not going to force it and they need to take the signs down. They go down and come back up, but we keep, we keep on it. Please. And if, and if they are right now, if someone is blocking off parking in front of their house, we come into the or whatever, we move it. Tracy, yes, please. We move it, yeah. That's exactly what I was going to talk about when I came down for ski drawing. Um, I saw multiple no parking signs in people's yards. And um, yeah, we're not enforcing them. Okay. We must have had some yelling at some point because somebody parked in front of my house as I came home to uh, came home. And all I did was stop to put my groceries out. They're like, we're sorry, we'll move, we'll move. Like I, and I'm like, this is public street. You can park wherever you want to, yeah. and I moved on. So I'm thinking that there were some there were some uh, some issues well, for these poor people. I, I have a little update on the ski drawing, but I'll, I'll tell you, we, we did have people putting cones out, and um, our inner chief went around and picked up the cones and tossed them in the folks' front yard. So if they if we saw it, we we politely put their property back in their front yard. Um, but we, if we saw them blocking off spaces, we, we didn't get them. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good, con good conversation. Uh, at this time, we have the city administrator's report. Uh, so I, I, I wanted to do this. I normally, we only need to do this during the department report, but we have lots of stuff to talk about. So events this past weekend uh, went spectacularly. Uh, Leadville was showcased in the best possible way. Uh, the weather was gorgeous. The event went off extremely, extremely well. Uh, I want to thank uh, the streets department. This is a big, big, big lift for them to, to get everything out, um, to block up all the streets, to do all the work, and then uh, to clean it all up. Uh, the chief texted me and well cleaned up by 6 p.m. Sunday night. I'll, I'll get go. Harrison reopened. Um, so I really want to shout out to the street department because they did a spectacular job. They've been doing it. They did it really with, uh, you know, I just know they'll do it and I don't really need to worry about the details. 
Uh, police department also did a spectacular job. Um, they uh, were out and about. Uh, I can report no arrests. So as you may recall, we had one arrest last year where we had no arrests. Uh, printing tickets, obviously, were the biggest issue. The chief, interim chief reported 32 tickets issued, uh, no tows. So we did not end up needing to tow any vehicles. Uh, the dogs and alcohol were not as much of an issue as they have been in, in the past. I'm going to say as much. You know, still some guidance being given about no dogs at the event. Uh, I know um, the interim chief re reported to me, you know, uh, how they were handling it. And, and really, as is, is, uh, Governor Green pointed out, just explaining to people the why. You know, and once people understood that it wasn't just an arbitrary rule that it was really to make sure that the uh, horses weren't scared and most people were compliant. Um, there was really uh, no issue with anybody refusing to come into compliance with that or failing to understand why, why we had that. Um, uh, let's see. The message boards worked well at the um, north and south ends of town. Uh, they only had two semis that they had missed the detour sign that they had to turn around on um, top of Harrison. Uh, everyone seemed to, to love it. The uh, department's got in spirit, and uh, a lot of them were wearing cowboy hats, which apparently were a big photo opportunity for a lot of folks who love that. Um, Duffy was super happy with all the support and was very thankful to the city. Um, you know, the after action reports we had that the departments had every night, um, you know, things were things went smoothly. Oh, there were a bunch of other events that went great. Um, uh, the the events that happened on, on Harrison Avenue in the evening went well, no issues, no injuries, nothing. Uh, Mineral Belt Mayhem, uh, we had the police did an excellent job of blocking off intersections and uh, um, I, I, they really went above and beyond. Uh, Officer Caraveo helped me uh, try and patch back together one participant's bike. <laughs> And when we couldn't get it back together, um, we transported it, it, she transported it to the finish line for the cyclist that I gave the person my bike. And so it was it was a really, I think a, it was a lovely showcase for the city. I was really proud of how everybody um, pulled together and it seemed like town's packed, which is good for us. It's good for our sales tax numbers. So uh, that's events. I think everything went very well. City staffing, um, some great updates for uh, city staffing. So we hired a human resources director. Uh, I know, it's fantastic news. Um, local candidate who uh, is going to be wonderful for us. She starts Monday. Erin Lucen is um, well known around the community. She is a kind, wonderful, compassionate, good leadership, good people skills. Um, we are going to train her on some of the ins and outs of human resources, but um, by all accounts, everyone we talk to says she has great judgment. Um, she's she's going to be a wonderful addition to our team. Uh, she knows some of our staff already and, and gets along well with them. So she starts Monday. Um, this second update is administrative assistant position. So you all may have noticed that has been posted in um, on our website in the paper. Uh, I was going to get the my usual plea to help get me the word out. Um, but right before this meeting, um, I received an application from, a, I think, a very uh, wonderful candidate. And she is going to come in on Friday morning for an interview. So that would be fantastic. That would be fantastic. I, I want to thank Donna, who has been the most patient person. I, I feel like we've done an excellent job of getting other departments fully staffed. And I feel like my one uh, failure, I'm going to use that word, is, is getting Dawn more help. And so I have told her, hopefully help is on the way. Um, because this would be a good, it, it will take a good, hopefully a good chunk of work on Dawn's plate. Um, third staffing update. So um, with regard to uh, steps for recruiting a new police chief, where we are right now is we are drafting a position description for the position. And I have consulted with um, other police chiefs on what qualifications we need. And so we are looking at um, minimum education and supervisory qualifications for the position, which um, I think are, are necessary. Uh, and 
basically uh, we the plan is once we get the qualifications put together we will post a position just like we usually do uh, and uh, one piece of advice was to post it out to the chief of police association apparently they have a, a good discussion group um, I am assured that there are you know qualified excellent candidates um, who will apply and once we get it posted what we will do is have an interview panel and um, I've had some discussions about um, interview, you know, who would be good to have on the interview panel. And so what I would like to do is ask the city council if the council would like to have um, and select a person from the council to be on the interview panel. Uh, so if you will give me some guidance on that, if you would like someone to be on the interview panel, can you um, have that? And if, we, if you're all, in consensus this evening, give me that guidance this evening, or would you like some time to think about it? I would say this. I've been on three inter interview panels for chiefs of police. I've lost faith. You may not. <laughs> <And> we, <laughs> I, I'm definitely not going to be honest. <laughs> well, it's not just that. It's just, it, it, you think about, okay, what qualifies me to make that selection? And I've come to the conclusion, nothing. Uh, however, I wouldn't discourage another city council member who wanted to be on that panel. Um, Tracy, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I would like to postpone a search for a police chief, and I'd like to have a conversation with city council on the future of the police department. And I've been informed that we should probably do that in an executive session. So. I would like to hold off on this. That's, I don't think that's our decision to make, um, but I, I don't mind having a conversation on the future of the police department, if that's what you'd like to do. Uh, we could schedule that uh, either for the next city council meeting, which is usually our big one because it's department reports or the first city council meeting in April, which is usually uh, typically a smaller agenda in terms of doing an executive session. What does everybody think? Given that I don't know what the situation is, I would say it feels like anything that is of that nature should probably be done sooner rather than later. So now it's already a packed meeting, but... I don't know if it's packed or not. I just know that that typically is our, yeah. our longest meeting. Um, I don't have any problem with that. If that's if that's city council's uh, wish, um, is that what we would like to schedule an executive session for the th the, the third Tuesday? Max, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Uh oh, <clears throat> Tracy, uh, I just got a quick question for you on that. Is is this about uh, perhaps? combining or getting some sort of MOU with the Sheriff's Department? Is that what your thoughts are here and maybe dissolving the police department in the city? Yep. Okay. Just so everybody's aware, I think that's what the, the executive session's about is, you know, how is there a need to actually have two different authorities with for uh, Leadville Lake County? Okay. Uh, then, with everybody's concurrence, we will schedule an executive session uh, for March the 21st. Okay, great. So, other updates. Uh, I, with the warmer weather, the parklet is construction is moving on great. So, as you can see, the roof is um, in progress right now. They're cutting the vents for um, all the uh, Ventilation siding is on as of right now. The ETA for expected completion date of the building is one month. Ooh. Yeah. And so what what the reason I don't say completion of the project is because the project also includes landscaping. So the landscaping will not be um, done until it gets a lot warmer. But just so you know, the building um, is one month as long as we continue to have weather where the um, the construction company continue to work and um, i've also asked main street to just give us an idea of when they might want to be doing the ribbon cutting um so i'll let you know about that um 
Oh, uh, one other person who I wanted to um, specifically thank for the events uh, this weekend, I wanted to, to, to thank Shanti uh, because uh, he was on, he, was on uh, he did a fantastic job with the restrooms. So Zeitz Park and getting everything shoveled in advance so all the sidewalks were clear, getting city in front of city hall all cleared. And um, I did a little um, inspection. So I would, as he had throughout the days, I would go and I would interview people how they, how, as they were coming out of the bathrooms, did the bathrooms look clean? Because there's a line uh, that I really want with mine. So I just asked people as they're coming out, I said, how's the toilet paper? And you know, how's the cleanliness? And then they said, it's great. Shanti hit it um, like at least three or four times throughout the weekend to make sure those bathrooms were clean. That's the kind of stuff when people come, they want to use the bathroom, it's clean, there's toilet paper that just reflects well. And uh, so now hopefully um, by the next few during, we'll have two restaurants that people can use. So I did I did want to do a shout out for Shanti because he was, he was doing that and all that. And um, those are all the updates that I have at the moment. Thank you. Any questions for the city of Minnesota? Mm -hmm. Can we put onto your radar to revisit sandwich board signs, please? <laughs> yes, it is. And um, so it actually, um, I was going through some old documents um, about some of the signage and the bidding process for the current signage that we have. And uh, I, I have some bigger, broader ideas about it, but I think that we, it, it may be, uh, I don't want to say a bigger project than we were thinking, but yes, it is definitely on. Um, it's actually on my administrative report every time I move to the next one. So, <laughs> I'm just not going to let it get. Uh, and I wanted to get some pictures of how Steve Dory and they were putting the snow down. I saw the same portion. Thank you. Somebody should do something about that. They should. Um, no, and I did notice um, the, with the people, and uh, I, I made a pass through for ski during with the quantity of people and then moving those sandwich boards out, it really impeded the flow. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It is, uh, it's, it's, we just need to find a band. And that's I'm, honestly, the, this is why we sort of focus on filling some of these positions sure. and so we can get some of the bandwidth to do this stuff. That's but also, we'd agreed to have like a, a work session. On the sandwich boards, and we did short term rentals last year. Maybe we can do a work session on sandwich boards uh, in March. Just a thought in terms of really having that conversation. March is already halfway over, and we're going to say April. And it's April. A <laughs> I'm just fucked. I, I don't know. Okay. I was reading her face more than. <laughs> <laughs> it was a hard no. Uh -huh. <laughs> Early, Early April. April. Early April. She got my email. I didn't say that. <laughs> okay. Something that I really, really, really want to get the bandwidth to address. Thank you. Yep. Uh, at this time, we have the public meetings planner. Uh, any anything on the public meetings planner that needs to be added, deleted? Oh, uh, we wanted to. Um, we, Forgot for presentations. We have a very important presentation. We added up the agenda for the update on. Oh, these. True. I'm so sorry. That's that absolutely you correct. Know, you know what? It's written. It's written but right here. Miss Ty, would you please? Uh, I appreciate uh, Miss Ty reminding us. Mm -hmm. This is actually really I'm so exciting. Excited. It is very exciting, and it will only take two seconds. But as you know, that it, well, first of all, I'm Lori Ty, and I'm city administrator and I'm a staff person for the HPC, as you all know. We applied for a CLG grant and we were awarded that grant on March 1st for $25,000. So we will be getting our survey, first <laughs> many surveys. Um, timeline is around the money will be distributed to us between April and June. And as soon as we get the money and have an agreement with them, we've already contacted our consultants and they're ready to go as soon as we get that money. So. Um, also, just an FYI on that, we are applying for three local grants to fund the excess because the survey will cost about $32,000 and we got $25,000. So we are applying for grants to get the rest of that to cover that. So 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Very, very good you insight. Can you just explain for? Oh, I'm just trying to be don't, fast. Oh no, the you're, you're okay. Uh, will you tell them what the survey, what what the the survey will be looking at, and what you're hoping to get out of the survey? Right. This this particular survey, um, in 2000. Uh, 15, they did a survey plan for us and gave us priority areas. And the only one we've done out of those priority areas is Harrison Avenue. This particular one is West End of by the Mining Museum, 8th and 9th Streets. And the survey will be um, an intensive level survey, which gives us the information on whether or not this structure is contributing to the the National Historic District, or it's not contributing. It kind of also lets us know when it was built, who originally lived there, or what it was originally used for. And so yeah, you it's have kind of an area of town. Um, I can be able to show that more. So it will it will make our processing of COAs much easier, faster. There will be no doubt. It won't take the research of us not knowing exactly what you know, is historic and what is not, this will give us a really in-depth um, plan. And I also just want to say this is the first of many that we plan to get because we would like the whole district to be surveyed. So we'll take them as our survey um, resources plan showed us what priorities are, are first. So that's what we're trying to do right now. Thank you. Nice work. Do you guys have any questions? I would just say congratulations. Yeah. It's a really big deal. Yeah. And so we wanted to pass along that always great news when um, departments and commissions are chasing down the money, really. And this is a big chunk of money. And so thank you. Thank you. Guys. Please thank make you. work for the big commission. I, I would have to say this Historic Preservation Commission has been the most active in my memory. I was on the HPC years ago, and, and we didn't do a tenth of what this HPC is is engaging themselves in to, to really get things done. and. And uh, and work hard uh, for the historic relevance of Ludlow. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, public meetings planner. <laughs> uh, any changes to the public meetings planner that occurred, anybody? Just that May is showing up already, and I'm like, oh my god, it's practically May. The years are almost over. <laughs> Well, according to Sharon, in March, he does. <laughs> I did not. <laughs> I had a question. Faster than we would ever expect. Yes. Tracy, please. What is the Leadville, Leadville Municipal meeting on one o'clock on Thursday? What is it's, that? It must be the, the Colorado Municipal League. Um, and we had just said one o'clock, but I don't know what that's that's for. It's the lovely municipal court. Oh, oh, the municipal court. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but uh, I, I I forget that they've changed the dates, the days and times that they have municipal court. So we we actually did that at the request of our um, longtime prosecutor. Uh, he is uh, fantastic, uh, but he also served as a one of the traveling judge for and so part of his uh conflict and, and it was he couldn't come to Leadville on Wednesdays so with the with the consent of our judge and everyone else we moved to Thursday so we keep Ron as our yeah. last year. Just as an FYI that's Ron Carlson. Uh he also is the attorney for the for Parkville Water uh but he's been been involved in Leadville for a long time. Really terrific person. Okay, nothing in the public meetings to planner. Uh, mayor's report. I just want to say, uh, first of all, I, I have some friends who come up uh, for, for ski joining weekend, and they just, they love coming to Leadville, uh, even if it's only once a year. I get it. It's okay. Um, and, and it shows us in the best possible light. Uh, the, um, the party, I'll call it the Spirits of the Shaft at the museum, was fantastic. It was it was an amazing event, uh, very successful. I think they they it was a fundraiser for the museum. I think they they really did very well. Um, uh, you know, next year I think they they may make it non-alcoholic. What do you, what do you think, Dana? I don't know if I go. Okay, uh, it was a great event. I say, I, this is 
anecdotal information after I, I spent my six string tickets, but when I talked to Janet Vitale, and I believe she said in the past they'd raised maybe a couple thousand dollars and they were looking at for a goal of ten thousand dollars and they perhaps raised as much as one thousand dollars. Now I'm not sure those were all the council members during tickets that they raised the money. I had up to a lot. I had two left. What yeah. what what's up? We used all six. I oh, my yeah. friends. Um, all I'm saying was it was a fantastic event, and and it sounds like they raised about their goal. So that's twelve thousand dollars is fantastic. If I'd use all six trade tickets, I'd still be there. No, you would still in a corner there. somewhere. You would still be there because you were in jail. So <laughs> still... Oh, oh, they did throw me in jail. Oh yeah, I saw that the first for public drunkenness. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Uh, any council reports? I have one. Please. Um, on April 8th, um, Saturday, April 8th at 9 a.m., I am pleased to share that the 87th annual Easter egg hunt is back at Ski Cooper. It's not really the 87th. Oh, really? I've just been doing it for so long that it feels like the 87th. Um, so it's back at 9 o'clock on April 8th at Ski Cooper. Yeah. I think that's great. News. Thank you. I do too. Spring of Lord. Yes, sir. The traditional for um, people be allowed to have public comment at the end of the meeting. We we don't have that anymore. So why not? Well, we just decided it was not worthwhile. Who decided? Uh, city council decided. Staff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, um, any other council reports, Tracy? Yeah, on um, April first, Saturday, Doctor Jeff will be here again for. Plan pet hood for a spay and neuter clinic at the animal shelter. Thank you. Well, good. Yeah, that's that's a pretty big deal, isn't it? Okay. You think? Just like you giving one good arm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's funny. So it's true. Any other council reports? Max. Oh, Max, yes, please. Now, this isn't a Leadville specific, however, um, it's good news for the state of Colorado is uh, Mount Evans, where I'm at right now on the Clear Creek Ranger District, is getting its name changed to honor the Arapaho and Ute people who are the both um, uh, consider themselves the Blue Sky people and Mount Evans will be turned into the name of Mount Blue Sky. Uh, and it goes up against the final uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, governor signed off on it la late last week, and it's going to the Board of Geographic Names on this Thursday, uh, March 9th, to uh, have its names officially changed. So that's uh, really exciting uh, for our uh, you know, traditional cultures here in in Colorado and beyond. Interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah. The weekly housing report for me. Um, great news so far. A lot of housing bills are going through the state that would be very favorable towards us, not just the rent control that I brought up previously, but currently they're discussing a um, municipality's, uh, I don't know what I would call it, uh, first right of first refusal purchase for any uh, family homes or dwellings that could be considered um, housing. It's currently still a clean bill. I forgot the exact numberage of it. I think it's like 1197 or something, um, House Bill 1197. Uh, but uh, basically it would give us 15 days. It, it would force any sellers to notify us first and give us the opportunity to purchase said home for affordable housing for 15 days. Mm -hmm under different circumstances, maybe that would be an amazing opportunity if housing is cheaper, but I'm going to make a conscious effort to um, ask them specifically for funding for smaller municipalities such as ours to potentially kind of subsidize that since obviously buying $400,000 homes is completely unbelievable, but that coupled with discussions that we've had about short-term rentals seems like it'd be quite a turn of luck for our community. Um, and if we can get funding for it alongside that bill to pass, that would be immense for our community to start 
getting back some of those units to be deed restrictions and that way we they, they would have no <laughs> that's specific to multifamily. Uh, I don't know if it's specific to multifamily. I would have to look deeper into it. And it's not a finalized bill. A lot of these bills don't go unscathed. So we'll see what the um what it ends up. But I am actually heading up um for leave it is uh for Latino Advocacy Day here soon. And I plan to ask those specific questions to Julie McCluskey um to kind of get a few more answers, um, if not to the primaries bill sponsor, which I think for the house would be Emily Sirota. So that's interesting, but it makes me wonder if there's not, if there needs to be something in the bill, and I don't know how you do it, is if I'm a seller and I know the city has first right of refusal, why would I just jack the price up on yeah. the price of the home um, from the very beginning, uh, knowing that I might accept less in the marketplace, but it would put the city in a, in a really awkward position so i don't know just a thought i will bring those concerns because i had Please. the same feeling was okay this sounds like it'd be a huge opportunity for us if we're able to get a fair market rate a fair rate. market rate yes that thank you good all right any other city council reports all right thank you at this time we're not going to take public comment steve it is 7 38 the city council is adjourned Thank <clears throat>